Thank you. So welcome to this planning committee meeting of South Oxfordshire District Council. I'm Councillor David Brotherson and I'll be chairing this meeting. I remind everyone this is a meeting in public, not a public meeting. Only members of the public who are registered to speak are allowed to do so, and I'll call on them to speak during the appropriate agenda item. The meeting is being held in your offices in Abbey House, Abbey Dunn. Committee members are here in person, and officers and public speakers are able to join remotely. The meeting is being streamed, streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel for public viewing. And the system has a facility to allow councillors who are unable to attend in person to contribute to the meeting, but only councillors who are present in person are allowed to vote. Some procedural matters for speakers and other members of the public who have logged on remotely to ensure that your microphone is muted and your camera is off for the duration of the meeting until you are called to speak. To share a presentation on the screen, please make sure that you stop sharing this as soon as it is no longer needed. Councillors wishing to ask a question or participate in the debate are asked to indicate their wish to do so by alerting me or officers by raising a hand. Voting will be a show of hands. Please raise your hand clearly and keep it raised to allow a count to take place. If it is unclear as to how members are voting through a show of hands, I will ask the clerk to undertake a roll call of those present and how they are voting. Two housekeeping announcements. The event of emergency. Please evacuate the building by the nearest exit which is in the corridor immediately to the right of this meeting room and goes to assembly point nine in the outside area beyond the fire exit. And if there are any officers, certain officers present, will assist you. Please can everyone ensure their mobile phones are switched to silent or switched off during the meeting. Councillors and speakers in the room, please be aware that the cameras and microphones are live for the duration of the meeting and more than likely will pick up everything that is said. Members of the public who wish to leave the meeting after their application has been debated are welcome to do so via the fire escape previously mentioned. When the meeting has ended, I will ask for confirmation that the live stream has ended. At that point, please leave the meeting and make your way out of the building, remembering to sign out as you leave. Yes, where's my agenda now? Agenda, here it is. So agenda item two is apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. Apologies for absence from receiving Councillor Ken Arlette, who was substituted with Councillor Stefan Gabrishak and Councillor Tim Bearder and Councillor Ian Snowden. Okay, thank you. But we are still for it. Quarry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Decoration of interest. To receive decorations of interest, the disclosable, I will say this, disclosable pecuniary interests, other registrable interests, and non registrable interests of any or any conflicts of interest in respect of items on the agenda for this meeting. See no good. Pledge of business to receive notification of any innate matters which the chair determines should be considered as urgent business. Do we have any urgent business? No urgent business, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um I've this one five. Proposals for site visits. Are there any proposals for site visits? No. <laughs> <laughs> We can probably get to an agenda then. Uh, anyway, would you take us through this uh, agenda item, please? Thank you, Chair. This application is called to planning committee as officers of recommendation of approval conflicts with the views of the town council. Gillett School is a state funded secondary school located on the southwestern outskirts of Henley on Thames. The site is bounded by areas of open countryside to the south, east and west. Fronting onto Gillett's Lane, the site lies opposite the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty. Henley on Thames Public Footpath 21 and Henley on Thames Bridal Way 20 lie immediately north of the site. Two sections of woodland across the site are designated local green spaces within the joint Henley and Harpston neighbourhood plan. The school and grounds contain a number of mature trees and shrubs, some of which are protected by way of tree preservation orders.
The application seeks planning permission to the addition of a 2.4 metre high green metal fence around the school grounds and is made to provide additional security when the school is closed and for the safety of the children during school hours. The fences to the east of the site lie within the setting of the Chilson's area of outstanding natural beauty. The gates and fences to the front of the school buildings would be highly visible from Gillett's Lane. Set back from the adjoining highway, the majority of the fences would be read in relation to the existing built form across the front of the site. The section of fence to the south of the school buildings is set back from the highway, runs through an area of existing woodland and would be largely screened from the public vantage point. The fences to the north of the site run along the Henley on Thames public footpath 21 and Henley on Thames bridleway 20, beyond which lie the rear gardens, the dwellings fronting Makins Road. The existing public right of way along the northern boundary of the school runs in grounds is lined with varying sections of close board fences to the north and the school playing fields to the south, and in officer's opinion is suburban in character. The proposed fencing along the northern boundary of the site would be highly visible from the public right of way. Due to the design and style of the proposed mesh fencing, views into and across the site and Gillett's Wood area of local uh, designated area of local green space would be largely retained. The fences to the south and west of the site line the school playing field where the application site meets open countryside. Glimpsed views of the fences may be available from the wider public vantage point. However, the use of green coloured mesh fencing would mean these views are limited and overall officers are satisfied that the proposed fences would not obstruct important views into and across the site from the wider area or result in any significant harm to the landscape setting of the site at the very edge of the settlement. It should be noted that the school has permitted development rights intact. Part 2 Class A of the Town and Country General Permitted Development Order would allow for the addition of fences along the perimeter of the site up to two metres in height without the need for planning permission from the local authority. In this case, officers are satisfied that the additional 40 centimetres in height would not significantly alter the character of the site and surrounding area when compared with the fallback position provided by the General Permitted Development Order. In the case where permission is sought for a 2.4 metre high fence, officers have been able to secure amendments to the line of fencing along Gillett's Lane, which in officers' opinion reduces the visual impact of the scheme when viewed from Gillett's Lane within the setting of the children's area of AOMB. A preliminary ecological appraisal, arbor method statement and tree protection details have also been secured as part of this application. Having reviewed the plans and supporting documents submitted as part of this application, the Council's ecologist and forestry officer raised no objections to the proposed fencing, subject to implementation in accordance with the submitted information. In officer's opinion, the proposed development is acceptable with the recommended conditions. The application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, we'll hear our, our speakers and come back to you for questions. Okay. Well, the first speaker I have actually, I see it on screen, so I'll let Ken. Right. Um, in our speaker, I believe Ken, you're going to be speaking on behalf of the town council. Yeah, hi, Chairman. I'll make this fairly uh, fairly short. Is there any chance you can go back to the plan that was uh, that was on the screen? Okay, 
if Ken can just follow that if you wish, if only we have to see. Which, which one was it, Ken, that you want? It was a, the plan ma mainly that showed the um, the footpath. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's the one yeah. which shows okay. the... That one Thank there, you. that's that's fine. fine. Okay. All right, I'll just go very quickly through the town council's concerns, and they are basically the height and the position of the proposed fence in it, making it totally unable for nearby residents and pedestrians. And I think the officer uh, mentioned that where she felt it was probably unable. The wooded area is the joint is in the joint Henley and Harpson area plan for open space. Uh, Gillets were against this, but it was supported by the examiner. Uh, and I think it'd be pretty sad tonight if the first chance you get to support the joint Henley and Harpson neighbour plan, this was be uh, was would would be voted against. Um, there's four and a half years work that's gone into this into this plan. Uh, the police have concerns in the past fencing in footpaths both sides, making it unsafe for um, pedestrians. We've heard this before. Uh, the proposed fencing will cut off animal corridors that have been there for as many years as anybody can remember, and, and that, that's a fact. Um, although the Town Council Planning Committee overwhelmingly support children's safety, the items above need to be resolved before planning permission is granted, hence Hendy Town Council reasons for refusal. That's all I have to add, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Arlott. I have one question. Can we just clarify which part of the um, fencing you are against? Is it the whole of it or just the part that's by the I think the council, the council mainly, it, it, it's the top part of it on on your screen, which is the 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 part that's outside of the of the green space where where the arrow is now. That's obviously green space there, which is in the joint Henley and Harpson neighbour plan uh, for open space, and all all that's going to do is to close it off if the boundary fence goes there. Uh, and we all feel it's unsafe for pedestrians to walk down a very narrow corridor. Okay, thank you. I have a question from Councillor Gillespie. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Um, and same Twitter. to you. Uh, but basically, I was, if the fence were moved to the school side, um, that of course would alleviate a lot of the concerns about it. And I was wondering, I mean, it seemed to be that the school's predominant sort of concern was the maintenance of the building there. And I was wondering if in fact the town council would be prepared to take on the responsibility for that mm. in order to have the fence on the internal side. Look, I, I can't really speak on behalf of the of the town council. All I can say at the moment, we're taking on lots of responsibilities for Oxford County Council and SODC. So yeah. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't want to take on any more at this moment in time, but that's just my view. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, any further questions? Yeah, I just have one, Ken, on the wildlife corridors we've talked about. Can you tell us a bit more about which wildlife corridors? Because you think you said that they're well known, I think you said. What's the fencing now? So I wasn't able to come on the visit. So what's the fencing there now and what how does that differ? Well, the, the only fence in there is some, just some wire fence in there and, and the majority of that has probably been laid down over the years. Um, so the what what you're aiming to do there, if the fencing goes I think you just need to go back to the other one. Yeah, you can see the wire fence in there now. Um, so obviously animals can get through there. So to put this uh, 2.4 metre fence there with, I would imagine, probably three inches, four inches between the, the uprights, obviously certain animals aren't going to get through there, which have been using that for, for years and years uh, as a corridor through. Um, it's not up to me to suggest where 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 the the fencing should go, but it it definitely shouldn't go where it's being proposed. Well, that's the town council's view as well. And actually, if you see the 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 drawing or the photograph down below, you, you imagine a two point uh, four fencing on the left hand side of that photograph. There, it's such a narrow corridor there. Uh, you, you know, we're talking about safety of um, of children. We should probably be looking for safety of pedestrians walking down there as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Arlott. I see no further questions, so thank you very much. All right, thank you, Chairman. Okay, we'll move on to our two speakers in support of the application, Catherine Darnton and Karen Barker. Are they both there? I'm, I'm here. 
I'm Catherine Dant and I'm the head teacher. I'm the one who's going to speak. Okay, just yourself? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. So, uh, yes, you have five minutes and it can start when I get my watch ready. It starts now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, obviously, as head teacher of the school, my very first responsibility is to keep our students safe. A perimeter fence supports this by preventing intruders accessing the site and preventing students leaving the site during the school day. I would also like to note that our staff work in isolated offices in unlocked multiple buildings after hours with nothing to prevent an intruder reaching them. We've had nu numerous incidents of incursions onto the site over the years. We sustained a series of 30 connected intruder incidents between April 2016 to October 2017, eight of which involved criminal activity. There was a serious incident in October 2019, which led to police involvement and extensive parental concern about site safety. We had an attempted break in out of hours in November 2019. And in 20, November 2020, there were travellers on the Henley Leisure Centre site who repeatedly um, um, caused incursions, pedestrian incursions onto the school site during the school day when students were present. Since October, we've actually been keeping a log. It is almost a daily occurrence that people come to exercise their dogs on our fields, which of course is not allowed because of the dangers from dog feces to children's health. We've had other incidents such as people coming onto site and stripping the lead off our science block. We've had an attempted theft from our garage. We've had people accessing the flat roofs numerous times, once uh, leading to a skylight being broken. And one of our areas where it was known that money was kept has been broken into three times. I'd just like to note that the erection of a two metre high fence along the full perimeter of the school now falls within permitted de development rights and does not require planning permission. However, the reason we've submitted this permission, this, this application, is because the Department for Education guidance published in 2019 states that the boundary is the first line of defence and should be protected with a secure fence or railings, such as weld mesh fencing to BS1722 standards or expanded metal or railings of over two metres high. Further, the R RSCA authority, or administered by the Fire Protection Association, state that to have real value, security fences should be at least two metres high to the top of the fencing. Our insurers, the risk protection arrangements administered by the DFE, require for a minimum standard of crime resilience, a continuous perimeter fencing for intruder protection. And we're currently in breach of that, and they have noted it. The design is deliberately transparent mesh, so as not to be a visual barrier, whereas you could, as you've seen from the pictures, the uh, rear guards and Makings Road and are largely lined with close board timber, timber fences. We also have uh, recently planted 420 mixed uh, hedging on the south and east boundary, which will add to the screening. It is important that the fence is along our perimeter so that we can maintain the woodland and prevent it being accessed, for example, by fly tippers. You'll have seen the news today of a school that's been just held responsible for a, an accident where a child has died because a branch has fallen on, fell on them during the school day. So we have to be aware that any we have liability for any accidents on our land. It's not adequate only to fence around the buildings has been suggested in the press because students access the fields all day, PE lessons and break, and they also need to protect it at these times. However, uh, we have listened very carefully to the planning office recommendations about the appearance of the site. And uh, we, do, we are prepared um, to make the change to set the fence back on the most exposed area of Gillett's Lane on the southwest and west boundaries. But please note, if we can't obtain planning permission, we can put a two metre fence along the perimeter. It's been stated that to fence along the edge of the bridleway would make pedestrians more vulnerable to, uh, more vulnerable to attack. I'd like to note that in all the other footpaths around the school, there are fences along both sides because they are the back of, uh, of, uh, of gardens, equally private property, just the same as the school is private property. Um, having uh, reflected on the thought, the thinking around the uh, the risks around the bridleway, actually, I would feel as a woman more at risk if I was walking along open woodland where an attacker could be hiding and potentially could drag me um, than I would um, walking in a clearly defined area with a fence. And of course, there is an alternative route to walk along the parallel Makins Road. If there's concerns about cyclists travelling too fast, obviously, there can be uh, slowing gates put in um, to enable them to be um, to be protected. Uh, Thank you. The Arboral Cultural Method Statement and the Premier Ecological, Ecological Appraisal um, documents demonstrate that we can implement without any loss to trees or priority habitat, habitats, 
will abide by the TPOs. The council ecologist has raised no objections to the scheme, stating that surveys have concluded that impacts on protected species are unlikely. Gaps under the fence will be installed every 10 metres to enable badgers and hedgehogs to move freely. The imperative remains to keep our staff and students at safe time, at safe at all times, and I hope you will support our application. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, has anybody got any questions for the teacher? I see then, so thank you very much for your time and your presentation. Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, Ward Councillor. Also, Deborah Shah. Okay. Again, uh, set this five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the um, firstly, Caitlin, thank you for your report, and also for um, uh, Catherine coming to speak to the meeting. Um, I don't think the debate is around security. We are all engaged with security of students. And I, I was a teacher at Gilly School for 30 years, so therefore I'm fully aware of the site security. What we are talking about, we are talking the nature of the fence and where it is placed. That is the thing. Can I point out Oxford Shears, South Oxford Shears corporate plan states uh, protection and restoration of the natural world. I'll just quote one bit of it. The, pr the providing habitats for wildlife, including wildlife corridors. There is no report in the planning about wildlife corridors for deer, foxes, etc. There are talk about badgers and the badgers have been uh, supplied with, uh, with uh, gaps at the bottom of the fence. But there is, there's no report about wildlife corridors. How, if every landowner in the country actually erected this close steel mesh fencing around every plot of land that they that they did, how on earth would wildlife actually uh, traverse across the site? Okay. Um, Caitlin said that the, the front of the site has been moved. So the fence at the front of the site has been moved so that it now runs, and I quote, it now runs through an existing woodland which is screened from the public. This is the one on Gillett's Lane. So originally there was Gillett's Lane and then there was going to be the fence. It has been moved beyond the woodland. Now I'm talking about the bridleway. What we have is a bridleway, and if we can get the pictures, <coughs> bridleway up. And members who, who have the site, is it the one before? That one, stop there. This is the driveway. On the right hand side, you will see this post board fencing. On the left, it is proposed to have a 2.4 metre high fencing there. And if the fence at the front of the school has been moved to beyond the woodland, then this should also be moved beyond the woodland, because I do consider it to be actually dangerous. This is 550 metres long, this corridor. So therefore, I think it is a danger to the public walking down there. We should be talking about protection of the public and also uh, and also uh, members of the, the school community as well. As well, um, the other things I would like to point out is the appendix B, which is page fourteen of your agendas. And it says, for a school two metres above ground level, provided that any part of the gate, fence, wall, or means of enclosure, which is more than one metre above the ground, does not create an obstruction to the view of persons using the highway. Now, I believe that down this bridleway, which is a highway, it's a highway for people, it's a highway for horses, it's a highway for cyclists, actually, with a close board, with a close uh, wire fence down that thing does actually is likely to cause um, obstruction to the view of people. So therefore it's actually in the appendix that that 2.4 metre fence uh, should not be there. Um, Gillets have permitted development lights for a two metre fence. SODC should not be party <coughs> passing uh, a planning permission where all of the aspects have not been explored, which include moving the fence beyond the woodland. Whether they've got permitted development or not, yes, in law, they can go ahead and do it. 
But what I would hope would be that the Gillett School and the local community and the Henley Town Council would sit down and engage and actually come up with a solution that ticks all of the boxes. So therefore, I would ask you as the committee to um, refuse this planning application. One more thing I will say. Can I, could you get the plan of the, um, the local green space up, please? So I can clearly... Stop, that's the one. Uh, if I mention, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, this is the driveway that we are talking about, and this is the the wood. This is a get the word in rice. Um, so, more, two more sentences, um, please. Um, this is designated by Natural England as a priority habitat for deciduous woodland. Right. It is also designated in the Henley Harps and Neighbourhood Plan as a green space. My proposal is that the fence is actually moved within the woodland or to this side of the woodland, which I think would actually make it safer for students. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Okay, Commissioner, has anybody got any questions for the local member? I, my, my question would be the same as I put before. I mean, an answer would be if the town, as, as a predominant, I mean, as, as we heard and we know, the predominant concern is the responsibility for all of it. Yes. Do you think there's a possibility? Is that? I don't think that Good School would relinquish the ownership of that woodland. And I think they, they are a community school. They are engaged in the ecology and the environment. Yeah. It's a perfect area for them to actually to teach ecology and teach yeah. the site. But the answer is, I think, if, if push came to shove, yes, the Henley Town Council, I'm sure, would take on the responsibility. Right. We have the money to actually maintain the wonder if it is so wish. Okay, thank yes. you very much. Okay, okay. Thank you, committee. We'll go back to Kate, if you're still there. Yes, she's still, still there. Also comes. Come on, sorry. Um, sorry. Chat. If, <coughs> are you concerned about the visual impact on the, uh, of, of this fence? If it's right on the on the boundary and close up against the footpath, yeah. Um, and would you be content if it was set in one or two meters from the from that uh, edge of that the bridleway? Do I ask for the picture of the fence to be put up? And if you've got picture, the pic, Caitlin, have you got pictures of the ones I sent to you from the? Well, it's actually from the Abingdon site. Uh, sorry, no, from the Cullum site. So we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, just the one before. Yes. There is a fence already set within the woodland. So the answer is no, I wouldn't like it just set one or two metres in. I would want it set 10 or 15 or 20 metres in, like the one that's already exhibited there. Um, can I pick up the picture that I sent to you, Caitlin? Have you got them? Which is of the, um, it was actually of the Cullum site. Yeah, uh, sorry, I assumed that they were meant to go to Catherine's items, so I forwarded them to Catherine. I think they may have ended up on her, her slides. That's my <laughs> mistake. Hang on, I might be able to find them. Hang on. Yeah, I'll, I'll just talk while, while they're being found. We, we then went from Gillick site to the Cullum site, and we actually saw the kind of fencing that is proposed to be put up on this thing. And I think it's absolutely horrible. And it's visually intrusive as well. And that's why I sent pictures to it, because this gives an indication of the scale and massing of this, or, 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 of this particular fence. And I'll repeat again, I'm talking about 550 metres of fencing. It's a long, 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 long fence that can easily be set the other side of the woodland. So therefore, it wouldn't impinge on anybody. Yes, that—that that is the kind of fence that is proposed. So at this point, we don't know what's proposed. This is so that's another worrying aspect of what. Well. No, we've got <laughs> specification of what yes. is proposed. Yes. Is, yeah. is, okay. is that a? Is that a two point four meter fence? I would say that probably is yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It was just strange that uh, having gone to a site visit where we're all talking about a fence, we now walk to walk towards this, this horrible fence. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. So, thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, 
Right, we will go back to, uh, to Caitlin now and, and take any questions you have for her. Are there any questions for the officer? Councillor Havel. Um, so actually, this is probably a question I should have been asking um, the school. Um, but does the school use the woodland for, as a play area or a forest school at the moment, given that it belongs to them? Not that I understand it. Um, Catherine may want to step in for me here, but I, I, not that I understand it. it. Obviously, it's a secondary school, so I think... Um, if you, no, if sorry, you we, can't, we, can't go, we can't go back, Catherine. Sorry, we're at a point we've moved forward. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't... I don't I, not, that's not my understanding, no. We saw no evidence of it. Chair, may I just point, point, clarify, make a clarifying point on just one thing before we continue. Um, the General Permitted Development Order um, defines highway as a road used by vehicular traffic. And so for, for the purposes of the General Permitted Development Order, that bridleway is not is not a highway, um, just so everybody's clear on the technicalities of that. So the highway as defined in the act. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, sorry. Uh, uh, basically, as I understood it, there is an open door for us to actually clarify what kind of fencing they have. I mean, what colour and what type. Um, uh, that, yes, you would be correct in thinking that about. there's been there's a number of different types that have been proposed. Um, and we could condition it to be for materials to be submitted, um, and that would be perfectly acceptable to the school. Right. Thank you very much. Any further questions? I see no further questions. Peter, no, no. Okay. So thank you very much, Caitlin. We'll move on to our debate. Um, therefore, I'm looking for a motion. Councillor Gabbershek. Um, Yes, Chair. Can I make a proposal and then I'll expand a little bit further? Can I propose that this plan permission be refused because the fence causes material harm to the rural nature of the site, the impact on the ANOP, uh, especially on the driveway? That box, um, and if that is seconded, I will expand. Thank you. Okay, do you want to second that? Thank you, Councillor Clear. I will just expand briefly because a lot of what I've said, I, I've said before. SODC planners have already conceded that the fence at the front of the school can be moved uh, away from the road uh, to the other side of the woodland. Um, therefore, what I am asking for is that that particular fence on the bridleway, which I think does cause material harm, to the uh, to the enjoyment of the bridleway, away and also the woodland designated by natural England as priority habitat deciduous woodland and I think it's quite right that Ken actually pointed out that we have spent four and a half years actually redesigning our joint Henley and Hobson neighborhood plan we've allocated this particular woodland where this huge and I will say prison like fence is going to put, be put upon the bridleway. Is actually blocking the views and the <laughs> and the um, the access to that natural habitat. We have designated in our neighbourhood plan as an allocated green space, of which there are two around Gillard School. So, therefore, what I am asking for the planning commission, uh, what I am asking the committee to do, is to actually protect that natural green space to actually move the fence so that it is not visually intrusive and uh, objectionable to the uh, uh, to, to the neighbours and also to Henley Town Council. Um, making sure there were 34 objections to this planning application and it was primarily based around the bridleway. So I would ask that this is refused and that Gillett School engage with the community, with Henley Town Council and also the neighbours to actually come up with a solution that is better. We all want security 
with our students. This is a community school in Henley. We all have a vested interest in security. I actually think moving the fence onto the playing fields is actually more secure for the students because the fence is on the right way. People can still climb up and over that two and a half metre fence and they are protected by the woodland from being seen. Then they sneak through the wood, they can attack whoever there are. By the way, I will say an aside, as an aside, that there is no other school in the area that has a 2.4 metre high fence. Right. If the fence was on the playing field, staff and students would actually see the people climbing up and over the fence, so they would be able to spot them coming for that. So therefore, I think there is a security aspect in actually making the fence be moved. Thank you, Jen. Okay, I'll come back to you a lot later. Okay. Chair, could I just come in on one point? Yeah. That's all right. Just a, a point of clarification. Uh, Councillor Gavishat referred to the AUMB. I would not be advising you to incorporate that reference within any reason for refusal. Um, I would give you guidance on what I think can be included, but having regard to the distance from the AUMB boundary, yeah. I wouldn't be advising you to include specific reference. Yeah, the AUMB is the other side, as mentioned. So I will respect a rewording. Yeah. If so, where am I? <laughs> I'm going to ask yes. Councillor Hilly if she wants to speak now or reserve her right. Yeah, I can speak now. Yeah, speak now. Um, I'm supporting the refusal because I do appreciate the dilemma to the school. And um, and the school is, you know, very much a part of the community and well respected. But I do think that it needs a conversation over the bridal path because it was very clear from the site visit how inappropriate a fence on that side would be. And if it was just edging the fields, there is some fencing there further up, which was on the photograph we looked at, which was a more acceptable type of fence. And it was also set further back. And that's all that we're asking for. And, and I'm sure that with a discussion, an agreement could be, I mean, I know they've got permitted development rights, but I think that they might be open to a conversation. I can't say that for definite, but I think we need to have that and satisfy ourselves because this was heavily objected to and uh, and it doesn't need to be. There is a solution and we just need to have a look at um, coming together on that. OK, thank you, Councillor Hillier. Um, I'll come back to you just a moment. Can I just ask that that photo has changed because that's not this application? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I apologise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right, Councillor Gillespie. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm finding this a very difficult one, actually. It is always on balance, and I'm finding this particularly on balance. Um, if it were a private property there, presumably they could put a two-metre fence like the one is on the right-hand side, which would be ghastly. It would be like a, a, a mousetrap going down there. And therefore, you know, the argument that, I mean, looking at the nest, that one that we've just had taken it removed, actually, you do you do see through. So that is a far better solution than a wooden fence would be. And I suppose that the school could decide to put a wooden fence up. And that would really make it a blinkered, blinkered alleyway, which would be very unpleasant. It is very difficult. And obviously, we did hear how many incidents they have had at the school with people sort of entering. And I hear that there are no other schools that have fences in, uh, around it of that type. Maybe they're not in a position that is as vulnerable, because in fact, that is quite, it is quite vulnerable down there, coming down, having been to the site visit and coming down there, people could very easily sneak onto it. And I mean, actually, the fact that there are dog walkers there every day, that's dangerous for children. That's something we don't want. And, that, and the very location of it lends it to that kind of incursion. So I am finding it very difficult, I have to say, and the fact they could put a two metre fence up in any case um, does sort of um, sort of belie that little bit of difference. And yet I do think that there could have been a discussion, I, and I know that the officer has done everything she could to try to waive that. Um, so I, I, I think that I will not be supporting the motion with heavy heart, actually, because I do see the arguments. Okay, thank you, Councillor Lesby. Anyone else wish to speak? Anyone else is wishing to speak? Oh. Sorry, do you want to speak? Yeah, yeah. I, I went on the site this and it was very interesting. I, I could see that the uh, the bridal way at the moment presents a very attractive uh, bridge between the suburban housing and the open countryside 
as 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 evidenced by the the woodland and i would i think it would be a great loss to intensify that suburbanization and urbanization of that vital way when there's really no need if the fence was set back i don't necessarily agree with council gabbershack about how far it should be but just a short distance in inside the woodland to make it less of a um a, a corridor i think would be would be would make a, a, a good solution and i can't see that it would have any um ad, adverse impacts on on the school and security by doing that um and if the if the wood if the uh if the footpath if the bridle way was wider the dog walkers would be quite happy to use it their dogs could have a little bit more space and they wouldn't need to uh duplicate in the middle of the uh <laughs> area where people are people are walking which i presume is the issue at the moment so i think the uh you know i think we should refuse this application on the basis that they the school comes forward with a more um acceptable solution okay thank you councillor okay. just if councillor howell did you wish to speak yeah i'd just like, like to get some advice actually is is to um if we were to refuse this application on, on these on these grounds suggested um is this reasonable um given that the um the, the land belongs to the school and needs to be maintained by the school um so i'm just wondering how how strong a, uh, <laughs> um i think that's where we have to debate between ourselves it's all reasonable um I guess Councillor Gillespie said it's a, it's a balance between what can happen already and what they're proposing and what we think is a better solution. Um, it is disappointing that uh, that discussion has not been fruitful. I think uh, the officer has been had that discussion; it's not been fruitful. Um, and now it's up to us to arbitrate, really, or make a decision. We've only got one or two decisions to make: one is to refuse it, and one is to pass it. We can't modify it or change it. Good, then it would be a different issue, but we can't. Um, before I go to Councillor Gavajet to sum up, I would just get clarification from the clerk. But before we do that, I will say that I will agree with everything that Councillor Dragonetti said, and I will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Chair. So, if I could um, just clarify my understanding of the concerns that have been raised by the proposal of the motion, the seconder, and those that are spoken against. The main concern is the issue with the um, fencing that's proposed along the northern boundary. So that stretch of um, 550 metres to be mentioned. Um, and the concern is essentially the visibility and the impact upon the enjoyment of the footpath, number 20 to 21. Um, and it's about the prominence of the fencing and the impact upon the uh, enjoyment of the um, open space and the woodland adjacent to it. Um, so essentially, it's, it's an impact upon the character and appearance of the area argument. Yes, and I've advised against yeah. um, referring specifically to the AOMB. Yeah. It's just the impact on the current experience in the area. Exactly. And we would uh, draw in references to appropriate policies and then touch on the Henry Potts and what do they think about it? Could we just ask whether there's anything Caitlin would want to add at this point? I don't, I don't think she, she will, but I'm sure she's um, actually. No, Chair, I don't think so. No, Paul, I think. I think. You summarised the concerns that I, I would have picked out myself. So, okay. Thank you. Sorry, well, okay. I'll now go back. I'll go to Councillor to, to sum up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I will accept all, all of our modifications and motion, uh, which I'm sure Councillor Henry will as well. Uh, very, very good advice. I would again um, draw the uh, committee's attention to the Henley and Hutton Plan and also the designated Natural England Priority Habitat Deciduous Woodland status of this particular woodland. Um, I agree with Councillor Dragonetti. In fact, the, the fence can be moved and it can be moved and we can have, we can have the fence moved without any problem. The school, um, coming back to Councillor Gillespie's point, the school can still maintain the woodland um, because they can come through either gates in the fence or um, or or around the bridle way to actually maintain the woodland, um, which, as you could see, the woodland is not maintained terribly effectively going on. As far as the dog walks are concerned and dogs are going on the fence, yes, dogs do go onto this site, but it is not 
at the top end of the driveway. It is right at the end. You know where we went onto the driveway yeah. down the bottom? Yeah. Well, I'm not proposing to change that fence at all. That fence will still be there and it will stop the dog walkers coming in onto the side. What I am arguing is that the, uh, the fence at the top end of the driveway, which is the woodland end, be moved. That's really what I do. And I would urge that the um, that the uh, uh, the planning committee support my motion or the motion for refusal. And I would sincerely hope that we have a conversation with the planners, with the school, and with Henley Town Council, and also the local community, because there were 30, 34 objections to this particular. And we come up with a better solution. The driveway is a beautiful corridor. It is not urban. It's urban in terms of the the um, the back gardens of the houses. But there, onwards, it's completely and utterly rural. We should not engage in um, well an act that actually puts up a metal fencing that makes it more urban. That's what it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Happy Hat. We'll go straight to the votes. The, the proposals that refuse the planning application on the grounds of essentially the harm to the character of the harm to the character of the area. Along the yeah, along the northern boundary. Okay. All those in favour of the motion, please, which is to refuse, please show. Yes. That's seven. All those against one and one abstention. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. So that looks like it's refused. Thank you very much, committee. Hopefully there'll be some conversations in the future. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item eight. Which is land northeast of the Fulham Science Centre. Okay. Um, again, we had a site visit on Monday, which was very useful. Um, it was here to present in person. Yeah. Um, one thing I would say, and it came out obvious on the site visit, uh, there's a lot of technical issues here, technical questions here. And if anybody has any technical questions, please leave them for the, the agent and the support they have. Um, I'm sure a lot of the issues will be uh, out for Catherine's um, knowledge base. <laughs> She's a planning officer, not a scientist. OK, over to you. Perfect, Chair. Um, I'd like to update members on a few matters in the report uh, before we get started. Subsequent to the publishing of the report, there were two further common consultation comments from neighbours. This takes the total number of comments from neighbours to eight, um, and the additional responses raise concerns already summarised in section two of the officer's report, um, also a concern regarding noise impact, which has been covered in the officer's report. And no objections have been raised in relation to noise from the environmental health. Right? Today, I also received a response from the environment agency, um, and they stated that they checked the environmental constraints for the location and advised that environmental risks to the area relate to groundwater protection. The council's contaminated land officer has reviewed the submitted contamination risk assessment and remediation strategy and has confirmed that these address the requirements for the phase two risk assessment and phase three remediation strategy. Therefore, condition 19, as summarised in section nine of the officer's report, is no longer required. And condition 20 should refer only to the submission um, of a validation report. 
plant. Uh, so this is a full application for a fusion demonstration plant located on Cullen Science Centre. And the application has been brought to Cullen Committee um, because of the scale of the proposal and its potential international significance. The site is 3.8 hectares in area, located in the northeastern end of the Science Centre, as you see in red on the screen here. The Cullum Science Centre is an old airfield that since 19, the 1960s has been used by UK Atomic Energy Authority, UK AEA, as a research establishment <laughs> to develop fusion technology. Before we look at the, the photographs of the site, I just wanted to point out um, a couple of things. Uh, the green area there to the north is the Grade 1 listed registered park and garden at Newnham Courtney. Uh, to the east of the site there is the East Clifton Hamden village um, and the conservation area there is shown in the green hatch and uh, you can see a dark green dashed line uh, dashed line around the eastern and northern perimeter of the science centre um, which is a public right of way. We see some photos of that in a second. So whilst the majority of current science centre has been built upon the proposed site is largely open with storage containers and other paraphernalia located there at present. So you can see on that photo that woodland sort of on the left hand side, that's the, uh, the edge of the registered park and garden. Um, and this wooden fencing you see here has recently been erected um, in relation to the decommissioning of the jet building, I believe. Um, and that's a view out uh, looking to the east towards Kifton Hamilton village. There's also an existing tree belt on the eastern edge of, along the northern part of the northern boundary. And there's a couple of photos that I took in with this. Um, so that is Tain Lane, which is the public right of way running along the northern boundary adjacent to the Cullum Science Centre. So this is a, an application for a fusion demonstration plant, as I said, to test the technology around magnetised target fusion with a view to proving and refining the technology prior to commercialisation. The proposal will not generate power. It will accommodate um, 80 members of staff and the building will operate seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The building is just over 10,000 square metres in area. Um, around 7,000 of which is process space and around 3,000 uh, 3, is office and support space. Mm. The core of the building is the demonstration hall, which you see there in the yellow. It's 38 metres in height um, with a diameter of around 50 metres. Located around the core in a concentric arrangement, uh, like blue, is um, a support building, which is the laboratories, offices, storage rooms, etc. That's at a height of 11 metres. Connecting the two would be a glazed atrium, which is known as the high bay. And the dark blue area is the external services area and loading dock, which will also be 11 metres in height. So if we look at the plans now, you, you probably can't really appreciate the, uh, the labelling on there, but in the centre we can see the, the demonstration wall, the glazed high bay atrium between the two, and then the roof connecting to the roof of the office the support building, which is a green cedar roof with a um, significant solar array on the roof. <laughs> this is the first floor, um, the office space, the associated supporting rooms. The, uh, the entrance to the building would be there in the southeast, as you see, um, coming up through the, the landscaped area, which I'll show you in a moment. Ground floor is the sort of more storage, um, protest type space, uh, the loading bay, the external service areas to the west. Here's the site plan. Um, so you can see there in the southeast the, the entrance, the bridge I mentioned to come up to the landscaped area into the first floor, which would be the office space. Also in this area, you've got the sub features and further solar array. Which we just read me out, I think. It also showed um, further significant tree planting along the northern boundary to connect the existing tree planting and also tree planting that's taking place just off site to the west. Um, 
you'll see at the bottom there, it's just the tip of the car park, which will accommodate 47 cars, um, right, which will be for electrical charging. And there's a covered cycle store there, which can accommodate 30 cycles. The next two slides show the elevations of the building. You can see in the top there, um, the landscape area leading to the entrance, as I mentioned, and the bottom one shows the uh, loading dock and the external services area. These fans also give an indication of the sort of the levelling. So if you look to the left there in the top one, you can see the, the retaining wall that will go along the northern boundary, which will help to screen um, the, the support building and then the tree planting above that further to help. That. I wanted to show you some CGI's because it's quite hard to get a sense of the building from the elevations. So this is taken from the design and access statement, looking up the landscaped area towards the entrance of the building. Um, the demonstration hall will be clad in ETFE, ethylene tetrafluoroethylene, which is a translucent plastic material, which you might recognise from the um, Eden project in Cornwall. Good for large roof spaces, um, lets heat rain in, lets light through. It also means that the material is more subtle than a traditional sort of metal, as it, it absorbs the light, reflects the tone and brightness of the sky, so that uh, it can blend in a bit better. The office element will be largely glazed, and support functions on the ground floor will be clad um, in a metal rain screen system. So, turning to the planning considerations. Policy Strat 8 of the site for Oxfordshire local plan supports the redevelopment and intensification of Column Site Centre, where it does not have an unacceptable impact, particularly on the character and appearance of the surrounding countryside and the registered parkland associated with Newnham House. This application has an objection from the landscape officer and the conservation officer in relation to its landscape impact, particularly in the long distance views. Um, and the harm to the setting of the registered park and garden. I'll come on to those in a moment. I just wanted to cover the issue of lighting because it's something that's been raised the most from the neighbour comments. I think there's a concern that the um, building would be lit 24 hours a day, or the demonstration hall would be lit 24 hours a day, um, which is not, not the intention at all. Uh, in this CGI image, you'll see that the intention is to light the demonstration hall from the bottom of the drum, collecting up so it wouldn't sort of reach the top, and the light would be graduated um, as it got higher. I think though it would be appropriate to set a, a curfew time limit by when these lights need to be switched off, um, which probably should be seasonal. Um, and I think this can be agreed by condition. All technical aspects in relation to the proposal have been satisfactorily addressed or can be addressed by condition or financial obligation. There are no objections uh, to the proposals other than um, by technical specialists, other than those referred to previously by the landscape officer and conservation officer, which I want to turn to now. Um, the site can't be seen from within the registered park garden itself because of the extensive tree cover. But there is a viewpoint on the very edge of the park and garden on the um, public footpath there, which I just wanted to show you. So you see there the top is as it currently is, the middle is um, sort of day one, and the bottom is after 15 years when the trees are at their sort of full height. And you can see um, this effective screening there of the support building. Obviously, the, the demonstration hall at the height is, is not going to be screened. Um, but I think you can see that the sort of choice of material will help <laughs> blend it into the sky in these short and medium range views. And so the long range views uh, are the ones that cause most concern for the landscape officer and conservation officer. And the view from the Whitmer clumps, which, you know, just about make out in this picture um, is the one that causes most concern because the, the we've got light buildings on a dark against dark wooded background. Um, so in that picture, you can to the right, the building on the end, the right hand side is the fusion um, proposed building. The one furthest to the left is the jet building, 
And in between, we've got shown the SEP rig haul, which is um, a current application that's not been decided yet. Uh, just for context, the jet building is 32 metres high, step recall is 30 metres, and the proposed is 38 metres. I don't think this difference in height is particularly perceptible at this range. What is notable is the, the sort of the shape of jet, so it's much longer around three times the width of the, the demonstration, so that uh, makes it more prominent in this view. And also, as we talked about the materials, um, the jet building doesn't have the sort of ability to you know, take on the sheets of the sky as this building would have. So I think it wouldn't be quite as stark as the jet building. Uh, the conservation officer considers the proposal would result in harm to the significance of the registered park in Darton. These impacts are indirect and exclusively to the setting of the RPG. As such, the impact is considered to be less than substantial under the test of the MPPF and the local plan. The landscape officer considers the proposed building would be visually isolated from the rest of the site, a jet in particular, and would be seen as another separate and very prominent building at odds with the rural landscape character and increasing the adverse impact of the science centre on the wider area. For the light, the, the site is located on a part of the science centre which is undeveloped, so its development will inevitably spread the visual impact. Ideally, buildings of such height would be clustered together rather than spread across the site. However, the northeastern corner is the only place that's large enough to accommodate the building. Um, and I wanted to show you a few extracts from the, the master plan. I think we all can see that. That's been produced by UKAEA, and this will demonstrate how it's envisaged the site will develop over the coming years. This is the and for the short term, you see they um, intend the intention is to, to fill in on the western flank, and a lot of that has um, been, been granted planning permission already. The, you also see the redevelopment of the entrance to the site, which again has recently been granted planning permission. The current proposed facility in the east is also shown. I think also this plan shows that at the current time there isn't any a sufficient open space that can accommodate uh, the size of the proposal. In the medium term, um, they're looking to redevelop um, the area in the yellow to create a more of a campus feel, um, which will take cars out of the centre, pushing the parking to the periphery, <coughs> filling in on the what's left of the eastern flank. And in the long term to 2050, looking at redevelopment of um, where Jet facility currently is, which, whilst in the short term, the decommissioning can commence. It's, it's a process that will take over a decade, so that's why that is not available. The location for the proposal in the uh, immediate future. And the science centre was taken out of the green belt through the local plan process to support the intensification of the science centre. Policy strategy. eight. It has, uh, envisages an increase in employment land to be delivered on the science centre and the adjacent column number one site to the west. In association with this, land to the west of the science centre has been released from the green belt to allow for the delivery of homes, which will create a sustainable community with work homes and leisure located around the railway station. The development of the science centre is a key part of creating this sustainable community. Rose development represents significant investment in the future of the Science Centre, which will support many jobs, both direct and indirect. The research taking place within the building itself will facilitate research into fusion technology, which could have global benefits in creating a clean energy source. The central government has made its support for the fusion industry known through its fusion strategy released last year, in which the proposed development is cited as an example to the commitment to transform Cullum into a global hub for fusion innovation and enhance its unique research capabilities. So the master plan extracts, extracts I've shown you demonstrate the investment that will be made to ensure the Science Centre can deliver this. Cullum Science Centre is a unique cluster of fusion technology in the UK, allowing expertise, personnel and equipment to be shared. Without continued investment, the UK will not be able to compete in this global market. The proposed development will bring this investment it will diversify fusion technology available on the campus 
as well as facilitating the UK's own fusion programme. Consider these benefits should be given significant weight. Great weight should also be given to the conservation of heritage assets and their significance, and the harm identified must be demonstrably outweighed by the public benefits. Consider that the harm to the setting of the registered park and garden and the landscape impact is outweighed by the public benefits of the proposal for all the reasons set out in the officer's report. It is, uh, for these reasons, the trial that it is recommended that planning permission should be granted, as in section 9 of the report, but with a slight amendment which uh, all will accept. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, just to uh, explain, we would like to amend the wording in section 9 of the report, that's page 47, where the recommendation is set out. Um, instead of the wording that you have currently, um, we would like to amend that um, to refer to authorising the head of planning in consultation with the chair to approve the application subject to the prior completion of the 106 agreement and the um, now 23 conditions, if I've got that right, possibly, with these amendments, but I, the, the conditions as, as set out. Um, the reason for that change is just to bring the wording in line with the with the constitution. So it was just our um, uh, re re requirement to bring that to your notice. So um, I hope that's clear. But obviously, in, in all other respects, the recommendation. Can, I, can I say that? Can I say that again? <laughs> yes. So so the uh, change to the wording is to authorise the head of planning in consultation with the chair to approve the application subject to the prior completion of a 106 agreement as set out in the report. And the conditions as listed. Yeah, that's that's straightforward. I know. Better than what's there, but it, it just it just doesn't change the influence of it. Yeah, that's all. But it changes. for the record. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't give me authority to do it. It's a full thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions, but we'll come back to those when we've heard from our speakers. Um, now I have a raft of speakers. As supporters, I know objectors or lots of supporters. Um, I presume Stephen Sensible, you will be leading this. Uh, is he? Is he? I guess so. Is he there? <laughs> <laughs> I assume you'll be leading this. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Sir. yeah. But even so, we only have five minutes between you all. So. <laughs> just, just to be clear, there are two of us in the room speaking. Yeah. Uh, other people uh, on Teams available to answer technical questions. Yeah, that's, 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 that's questions fine. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that I'm going to sign this either. No, no, like, no, that was, that was the problem. We did have this, yeah. uh, as, uh, as as your colleagues from Scotland Jones will know, that there, there were questions there, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not expected to know, really. Yeah. So, okay. Do you want to take the chair? Um, yeah. Have a, Thank you. Five minutes, and we'll start in five minutes when you start speaking. We say we are first, would that help you, Chair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Matt Ludworth. Uh, I'm Stephen Sensical, uh, Head of Planning Development at Carter Jones. Uh, and I'm the Technical Program Manager at General Fusion. I've been given the opportunity to come and give you a brief overview of the FTD, FTP project, Rosa Cullen. I'd like to start by giving some context for the scheme. Fusion has a potential to be the answer to climate change by creating clean, safe and abundant power source. It is not an overstatement to say the development of this technology is of global significance. In general, Fusion is one of the key players in its progression. These points are recognised by the UK government and underlined by their funding commitment towards the scheme. General Fusion is on a journey to develop a machine that can create fusion. The FDP is an industrial scale prototype and the next step on that journey. This is the culmination of two decades of work, which aims to prove that we can create the conditions needed for fusion to take place. UK AEA at Cullum is the global centre of excellence in fusion. There is no better site for this machine to continue its development. We are excited to benefit from their collective expertise and experience in the field, as well as being able to offer employment opportunities in the region. The facility has been designed by Sterling Prize winning architects ALA and OVARP engineers to meet the highest standards of sustainability, the lowest impact to the environment. We hope you'll agree that this project is worthy of approval, 
to further the quest for abundant and clean energy for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Matthew's uh, described why the so it has to come to Cullum. Uh, so I'll talk about um, more planning related issues. Cullum campus is removed from the green belt as part of the last local plan review. It's allocated in the local plan policy strat eight as a strategic employment site. That policy supports the redevelopment and intensification of Cullum, provided there are no unacceptable visual impacts, particularly in relation to the registered parkland at Newnham House. We acknowledge that the FDP will be visible in short range views from the north and in limited long range views from Whitman Clumps to the south. However, the case office has concluded first that the short range views will be mitigated with on site planting, and second that the long range views will be considered in the context of the rest of the Cullum site. And I won't repeat what Catherine Pierce has explained to you this evening. Uh, I think she did a very good job there, if I might say so, in just explaining the context within which this sits in views from the south. The park, the park land to the north is a heritage, heritage asset. The council's conservation officer has concluded the FDP will cause some harm to its setting. I must emphasise, however, this is not a visual impact point. The FDP will not be visible from within the parkland because of the extensive tree cover that exists at present. And to be clear, the perceived harm to the parkland setting has been categorised as less than substantial. Also, that these are the only identified harms. As the committee report confirms, the proposed development is acceptable in all other respects. There are no objections to the proposal from any other technical specialists or statutory consultees. In coming to a view about this proposal, the correct approach is to weigh the limited harm against the public and planning benefits of the scheme. This is what your officers have done in section eight of the report. In short, those benefits are that the FDP will support and enhance the UK's position as a world leader in fusion technology, provide a significant number of jobs in the local area, both direct and indirect, produce inward investment of circa 300 million pounds, support the national and international objective of advancing fusion technology and harnessing clean energy, produce direct environmental benefits from the provision of an energy efficient, low carbon and bream excellent building of exemplar design, and provide indirect environmental benefits in the long term to help in the UK and the rest of the world to move closer to achieving fusion energy and thereby being less reliant on fossil fuels. In conclusion, Chair, members of the committee, your officers have produced a very thorough report and have concluded that on balance, uh, the decision lies with a, sorry, but on balance, uh, the application uh, should be approved. I would ask, please, that you accept that recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, committee, well, as you heard, there are other specialists in the wings, so to speak. Um, has anybody got any questions? Um, it's a it's um, a daft question, really, but I think I think because um, just to bring it down to, to <laughs> my level, um, but why is the demonstration form needed? Um, because it doesn't generate energy. So, unlike the power station, for example, that that had a purpose. I understand what Jet does, etc. And, and if, it, if this application was refused and the de demonstration hall um, couldn't be built, what would be the impact um, and what, what would we be losing? Could you just explain yep. that, really? Yeah, 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 please. No, no, <laughs> please. Um, yeah. Yes, I can. Um, uh, so uh, this, is, this is a test of research facility. So General Fusion has been developing um, its technology over the last two decades, we, uh, but we haven't built it at this scale yet. Um, we need to build this machine at this scale, we need to put it together, and we need to, to, to use that to demonstrate that we can create the conditions needed for fusion to happen. So the uh, essentially this we need we need we need to build a prototype, it needs to be this size, and so the demonstration hall needs to be as big as it is to fit that machine inside of it. If we did, uh, if, if we weren't able to build the demonstration hall, we wouldn't be able to build the machine, we wouldn't be able to to prove um, uh, this, this this technology works, that we can um, uh, create those conditions that we need. Um, uh, and so, back to drawing, you know, the, the the next step in the journey, as I was as I was talking about, um, uh, we have to be somewhere else. And in terms of that somewhere else, just to pick up on yeah. on, on on that point, you know, yeah, Cullum is is the is the UK home and currently the European home of fusion research. Uh, 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 the jet facility is closing in 2024. 
Um, but all the expertise is still there. So there's no better place, um, uh, I would say, in Europe uh, uh, in which to locate this facility, take advantage of all that expertise and experience uh, that's been garnered over the last 50 years uh, on, on, this, on this site. So that's why it needs to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. My question just relates to CKRE's questioning. Uh, the feature lighting, is that necessary? Um, because that in the tower part that we saw in the plastic, can that be possibly it there in the picture? Can that be taken out? Can that does it need that lighting? I think as as Catherine said in her presentation, um, there'll be a condition that, that restricts that lighting. Uh, and I think we're very happy to talk about, about that and to accept a restriction. Um, so yes, it, the, the, there are things that can be done to, 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 to limit that lighting uh, to appropriate times of the day and appropriate times of the year. But if it was not there at all, is that a possibility? Um, there'll be, there might be some glare from, from the facility is 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So, um, yeah, it needs lighting internally for, for those working in it to see. Yeah. Uh, and so there might be some spillage uh, in, in that regard, but there are controls in place to make sure that is not, an, not at an inappropriate level. Yeah, I just, I understood the lower section, yeah. but it was just the top section. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Uh, yes, can I, I, I just have a, uh, a couple of questions on planning. Um, thank you for. I'm a physicist, so thanks for the explanation on the physics of it. Um, could I ask about the timescale of this? If planning permission is granted, what's when is it going to be built, and how long is it going to be last? How long is it going to last? If, uh, if planning permission is granted, we will be starting very, very soon, and uh, build as quickly as we can well. mobilise and, and get people on site. We'll be starting work. Yeah. Okay. And the completion of the build. And then how long is the building going to last? So completion of the build, uh, I think it's 2025. So okay. it's, 2025. That, it's that kind of region. I, I'm, I'm talking rough. Yes. Yeah, 2025. Yeah, yeah, it's that kind of region. And then how long do you envisage the building lasting? Uh, design life of the building. We've got a another person in the room with his hand up, I think, can answer that question. Yeah, <laughs> 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 it's only five years. So this is being built as a as a permanent facility. It's not being built uh, as a as a short term facility. So um, at least a, a life cycle of beyond twenty five years is, is anticipated. It's not a, it's not a, just for uh, just for short term use. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to pick up on the lighting bit. I mean, if after it's been built, the the, you know, the visual aspects of the lighting. Is found to be unacceptable. Can you fit? I mean, I'm going to cruise the crew. Can you fit curtains on the inside to actually minimise the light spill? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, you know, it, in in essence, we uh, so so uh, the design team is taking great care to make sure that that it's mitigated as much as possible. You know, this uh, a CGI image rather than the kind of detailed design which very much limits light spill. Um, the 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 lighting uh, during kind of night hours is. Uh, with internally with motion sensors and things. So yes, it, it's, it's, it's mitigated as much as possible. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do you want to speak? Yes, actually back to its global significance. And yeah. you were saying that if in fact it couldn't it got turned down and couldn't get it there, yep. it would go abroad, presumably. It, it, uh, we we don't know. Is the yeah. honest answer that that's, there that's, is a strong likelihood. Yes, it's a possibility, certainly. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, yeah, just a, a quick one. So you, you want to build a bigger, I suppose that's a top of that. There's not a still no, from there. No, I'm afraid <laughs> you to, yes. Okay. But uh, it's it's synergistic to what ITER is, basically, in terms of advancing research. Uh, yes, but it's, this is a different kind of technology. So uh, so you're right, it's it, it's all about advancing the, the research. Um, this is effectively a different approach to, right. to a top of that. Um, so, uh, I'm aware of other top maps in the in the county as well, but uh, mm. okay, so different technology, different technology, different approach, Excellent. and also it uh, will count for reasonable reasonable number of employment. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and okay. you know, we believe a better approach.
Yes, I admit being biased. Yes, thank you. Um, in the officer's report, it says that the uh, the building could be clad in these transparent, sort of cushiony yes. panels. Yes, yes. Are they are they uh, transparent all the way through to the building, or are they are they sort of is there a sort of a, a sort of solid building behind these panels? Uh, yeah, so that that's a great picture. You know, you you can see in the bottom left, you can see straight through these to, to the they're translucent. So, so it's so right through, not like the um the thing of the Eden projects, external light. So if the building is lit internally, all of that light spills out, doesn't it? Uh, so the each FE you can see there is around the drum, the the demonstration hall, um, and the, so the 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 kind of the operational lighting for offices uh, is, yeah. is in the lower. But I'm just really interested in the. Uh, the drum, mm -hmm. because am I right in saying this is going to be the tallest building on the site? Also, um, can, can you bring Steve to like this? The architect um, on, 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 online, and he's, he's probably best to describe this, this issue, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. are, you, are you okay with us bringing in the architect? Yep, yep. sorry, we need to get everything resolved. Got Matthew Wilkinson Hi. from you. Yeah, Matt Wilkinson. Uh, just to clarify, the within the ETFE, there is a, a concrete confinement cylinder which encloses the fusion machine, and that is there for containing noise, containing thermal heat from the machine, uh, and essentially the ETFE wraps around that to provide the waterproof uh, rain screen layer and a kind of thermal uh, facade. The space between the ETFE and the concrete cylinder actually operates as a thermal chimney so it optimizes natural ventilation of other spaces within the building um, and that's why the ETF is positive because actually it lets in and warms up that zone so it acts as a thermal chimney so the lighting of the fusion hall that's inside the fusion hall would not be uh, running out to the environment because it would be contained by the concrete wall inside so really what we're seeing in the space between the ETFE and the concrete is a small amount of light spill from the space beneath that chimney and uh, for small periods of the day uh, to be discussed in the condition discharge, uh, hopefully, the uh, symbolic lighting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to understand a little bit about the context of this. Um, it's, it's not strictly a planning question, I suppose, but um, just look at the sort of the business case for this, um, because it's not it's not directly publicly funded, is it? If you could just explain, there's a contract with a Canadian company, is that right? Just so that we can get the context of uh, so the business case and then longevity of the building. Uh, again, Steve, Stephen, behind. So we, we as, as, as the government, we are um, we are providing the lands and we are providing an investment towards the towards the, the facility itself. So the, the, it is a, it, the, the drive of the campus is to uh, is to create um, external investment in fusion in the in the in the science part to promote uh, the, the future growth of, the, of, of fusion in, in that in that cluster. So it, it is in line with the current policy for the development of the of the, the campus um, that we are that we are facilitating the um, the occupation of the site by General Fusion. We will be the landlord, so uh, uh, we will we will be the we we'll be the owner of the building and the facility. Um, they will be our tenants. But the, the investment, the, the main bulk of the investment is coming from from. Um, from international investment into the, into the site. So uh, our investment is, is, is much smaller than, um, than, the, than the international investment that is going to come into the, into the region. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to think about the risk around this by having this big building and then you have, you're, you're renting it out to somebody at some point, presumably. Um, if the the area, if you like, has to sort of um, put up this little intrusion, if you like, you know how how uh, 
how better it is and how, how you know how much will this actual investment and this intrusion be worthwhile in the end you know it's not like you're saying that the the British government have invested in here and they're going to put in science they're leasing it out to somebody who could at one point withdraw but I, presumably that's you've gone through all that I just want to understand it I'm not saying you haven't gone through that's that. Good. Just uh, join, so I'd like to give what's on the head of uh, campus development uh, UK uh, The building has been designed in such a way that uh, we in general fusion of the tested concept and, and, and move on to, to the next step in their journey, it can be used by uh, another tenant further down the line or indeed UK AEA to, to further our mission in terms of fusion. So it's very much a long term building that will be used you know, either by a commercial uh, fusion company. Uh, external to UK or be ourselves in, in long term and um, we've designed building in, in that way and that's why we've had such a collaborative design process because we've had both sides working really closely together mm -hmm. to make sure the building meets both both our needs. And I, and I think uh, you, you probably have heard of the, uh, the, the government's fusion strategy and, and that is about collaborating with the, yeah. with the private sector uh, because our government can't afford to do it all by itself is, is the truth uh, and you know th th these collaborations are happening in other aspects of, of, of work at column two and on other sites um, within the portfolio so it's it's very consistent with the government's approach to science and technology going forward Thank you. We were finished with the questions. Well, I'm just for every other question anyway. Yeah, I haven't got any. Therefore, I think that no, it's, it's, uh, it's completed. So we can stand down. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. The only other person I have to speak is uh, Councillor Casey Rohan, who is a local board member. Thank you. Um, and, uh, uh, difference here is you have five minutes. Um, um, I think I think the key thing for us to um, consider here is the the visual impact. Um, I slightly disagree with the officer when she was saying that, that it's a balance between uh, these policies. I think we know from our training that um, a planning application only has to fail on one policy to be refused, um, and the key one that has um, come from the parish council and the red and the objectors, and what I'm concerned about is the visual impact on the surrounding area and the um, Newman Park and Gardens. Um, so I just want to bring the committee's attention again to the landscape architect and the conservation officer's um, objections. Um, and I think that what we really need to decide is um, looking at policy strat eight on the, the visual impact, whether it's acceptable or unacceptable, because it's our policy in the development plan. The strat eight says that we will support development at Cohen Science Centre unless the visual impact is deemed unacceptable. So it's whether you think this, this is unacceptable or not. Um, I think there's absolutely no doubt that this is, and this is my concern, that this is not just a very high building, it's actually a very, very large building. We were talking about 50 metres in diameter as well as 38 metres high. Remember, we were at the um, site visit, you know, we were looking at the, the pylons and thinking that's the sort of height. But if you think about a pylon, it's very narrow and it's sort of transparent. So um, it's it's the massing that concerns me um, and the impact from the you know, park and gardens, the setting of it, which is really, really important. It's not just, as we know, um, for those listed and conservation areas, it's the setting that's important, not just the actual um, place itself and where you can see it from. We saw the footpath that's just right on the boundary, chain lane is the footpath, and that's heavily used. Um, I think from whatever angle you will be able to see this um, all the time. So I, you know, I'm concerned about the visual impact. I'm concerned about the the cumulative visual impact as well. Because if you're thinking about the step going forward, which is coming. Um, and the jet building, which is going to be decommissioned, I'm, I'm not quite sure which bit of it is going to be taken down, but some of it is going to be taken down, but not all of it. So there is a there's a cumulative visual impact in this area on the surrounding countryside and on um, that 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 park, and quite close to what uh, you saw in the first map, which I think um, Catherine showed us the first map, which is very close to uh, Clifton Hamilton Conservation Area. 
So it's just you know just really considering that 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 one policy. So strat H, is it acceptable? Is it unacceptable to have such a huge building? I think there's no doubt in the officer's report and from what um, the speakers have said that this is you know uh, an important part of fusion. But whether it's actually acceptable and and it's our duty, our um, decision whether we think this is in line with strat eight. Thank you. Anybody got any questions for the local member? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at the moment, is the uh, jet building 32 metres and this one's going to be 38? Yeah, so, yeah. so yes. that's going to be the, this is going to be the tallest building in South Oxford, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and that, I think the current jet building is visible from uh, no woodcut as well. and and for the children's about what we do, so it's uh, not just the Whittenham clumps. So that's right, and and from the from Whittenham clumps, with the when they took down the cooling towers and did the actual the view was improved dramatically. So you know, thinking about replacing that with something else, and while the jet building is is white and quite shiny, mm -hmm. and this isn't, and they have I you know I absolutely acknowledge that they've taken um, care in designing this. There is no doubt you'll be able to see it. It will have a big visual impact. On the surrounding area. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to say, you know, as well as I do, about where the, where the new road is going, where the bypass is going, which is just on the other side of that. So it's going to be a substantial. Sorry, question to you. Um, yeah, question. I'm asking about where the road is going to go, the bypass, which will be significantly larger and, and visual and far more rumorous, far more noisy to the. To, 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 to. I'm just saying, you know, effectively, how do you compare the damage? Done. Um, those two. I can tear the damage. Okay. Um, I think I think you're you're right. There is a cumulative <coughs> impact of all these things on that area. Um, and you know, it's a single carriage road the bypass. Um, so it, it's hard to say, but it will go in between. If you look at the map there, mm -hmm. between the Clifton Hamden bit on the right there and, and, and the orange red bit, it will be in between that right on time, but the bypass yes. will go by if it if it passed. Um you won't be able to see the bypass from, you know, ground level far away. You will be able to see it from within the front. That's but the from job. Newnham Park itself, you're not going to be actually, because of the trees, you won't actually see the building. <coughs> Sorry, we're getting into a debate, Elizabeth, please. Uh, no, no, I'm just asking questions. Um, I, I'll, I'll, one I'll, question, I'll, 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 question I'll, 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 How many questions yeah. you've asked? Please. Okay, yeah, one. Right, okay. I think we'll move on. We need to move on. Right, I'd like to, um, questions for... Well, I'll pursue all this report. Catherine, questions to you. Are there any questions for the officer? Yes. Good morning. Yes. Uh, yep. Can I just have one, which is... I resisted asking the question of Sam, because I thought we... It is acknowledged that this new building is 38 metres high. How is the width of it compared yeah. to the jet building? Um, because the jet building is 32, but it's considerably wider. Yes, the jet building... Um, around 140 meters wide. Demonstration hall um, has a diameter of 50 meters. Um, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Can I just, yeah, just to clarify that, so the jet building can be put in this wide, but the 32 meter bit is not all, it's not all of it is 32 meters wide, isn't it? There's just two. Yeah, I think it's the yeah, yeah. and it dips down. Yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not all. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, we're interested in the Yeah, so it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not all. Got that. Sorry, we're interested in the officer, so is there any more further questions, Peter? Yes. Um, you, um, in your report to the Catherine, you refer to the, uh, UK fusion strategy. Uh, this is um, well, there's the three steps to it, and there's a commercial one. And this project falls within the commercial. And, you know. um, do you think uh, this the UK is a UK fusion strategy a government strategy? Do you think there's a question here? But if we refuse this application, the government will step in and treat it as a, um, an infrastructure project, which you know, they will put forth through that and other projects get forth through. Um, I think if it were to be refused, um, 
there may well be an appeal. Um, and then it would, that's quite difficult. Then it could be called in by the Secretary of State and, and it could be reviewed yes. by the government, essentially. In, in your sort of, in your, 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 your spent a lot of time on this, this application, is, is that a, um, in your view, is that likely? Um, well, the, it's clear that that central government are very interested in this particular project because they did in fact cite it in the fusion strategy as an example of the, this third pillar. So I think it, it's quite clear that the, the support is there for it. Right. I just got a question. Uh, many of the constituencies have mentioned the lighting and I called it feature lighting as CPRC said but it's that's the symbolic stroke beach lighting. Um, what I'm worried about is that to say that there's been so many objections, the lighting details are still to be submitted. And I want to ask, is there a possibility that that symbolic lighting could be completely removed? Because obviously we don't need it in the drum. Uh, it's just obviously the office space down below. But that's what you would see from a distance at night. Even if the hours were changed and there was a curfew, could it be removed entirely? That's the question. Yeah. But um, it, we could potentially, as part of the condition, look to build in um, a kind of review period, see if, if the lighting is unsuitable. I can see why an architect would want it, and I couldn't understand that. But yeah. we're looking already at visual impact, and anything that we can do to mitigate that in the conditions would be preferable yes. and easily. Yeah, so that could be a possibility. Yes, yeah. 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 And any proposal that we just put forward next, uh, that could be there, could be in the proposal. Yeah. So we finished with questions for the officer. I think we have, and therefore, we to a proposal. Thank you. Sorry, Gareth. I'm going to propose the acceptance of the wording on page 47, but I am going to invite Paul to help us with. Condition 23, which we've all talked about. Condition 23, lighting details to be submitted. We need a sort of wording there that says it's going to be reviewed. <laughs> um, and if my proposal is seconded, I, I will then speak a few more words. Uh, yes, I'll second it. I'll second it. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. So just a few more words. I, I think we got a bit confused with the lighting because the, um, well, I, I certainly did. We've got this clever material cladding, the building, but there's a concrete cylinder in the middle. So how the light is going to get out of the concrete cylinder, I think uh, Councillor Hillier alluded that it's coming up from the offices below, maybe. Anyway, so there's a bit of confusion. So we do need that condition to be looked at and also reviewed after the building is commissioned. Um, in a way, and I'm sure, I'm sure the common side would welcome uh, being neighbourly going onwards. That um, any light is not spilled you know, you know, too much, too much from the side. Um, I think we can we can agree that this will have a visual impact, but it is in our it is in our planning policy to have this particular site as a an area of economic development provided provided the visual impact is 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 contained um, there's no doubt that it will be a little visible from Whitman plant but I do take on board the question that I said that this building is taller but it is narrower than the existing jet building I mean the jet building is 32 meters high but it does dip in the middle down to by about five metres, but it's a, it's a long, it's a, it is a long. Um, and the main impact is on Newnham Courtney um, and the 
uh, conservation has says that the, the impact is acceptable. So therefore, I'm minded to propose and approve this planning application. Thank you. There is, of course, a solution to, uh, to all of this, that uh, when, when this site is built and the jet site is decommissioned, when they have proved the technology for demonstration fusion, they actually then build a fusion reactor on the jet site so that we actually keep the employment in, in Oxfordshire. <laughs> and, and also we have a solution to our climate crisis. That's, that's not you, part of the plan. Yes. Still 30 years away. Yes, away from Thank you. OK, thank you, Stefan. Elizabeth, do you want to speak now? Or? I'll speak later, thank you. you speak later. Yeah. Yeah. OK, all right, it's open for debate. Anybody wish to speak? Councillor McDonald. Yeah, just to say that this, this is big, class-leading science worldwide, not just the UK. And doing their best to minimise the impact of a world class proposed facility. And I need to look to research more about it, not being a talker, man. It's making use of an existing site, it's sustainable. You've got colour in the railway station nearby, and you've got uh, local habitation nearby for, for scientists. And I, I, I feel I wish that the rush common days of, uh, that we had beforehand could come back. It was very nice to have accommodation from Cape Clear. And um, I'd certainly be very happy to support this. Councillor Thompson. But, um, I can't in any way whatsoever support this. There's too many negatives. It looks like a gasometer gone wrong, an illuminated gasometer. We had one in Didcot, it looked terrible. <laughs> uh, it's a blot on the landscape, complete blot. The travel plans are absolutely atrocious. It doesn't mention anything about the railway. Well, we doesn't even stop there on a Sunday anymore. So, and it's 24 hours, this building. Thames Water object to it. They said there's not enough water. I thought you had to have water to cool these things. I might be wrong. So there's um, no way whatsoever I could um, support this whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, just before that, a point on the constitution. Uh, in the plan, uh, code of conduct for planning, uh, if you're not in attendance throughout the whole uh, discussion of the application, I believe you missed a segment of the case officer's report. Yeah. So yeah, I I I can't I can't um, su uh, support this. Um, as I said, um, it's not really a, a balance between harm and benefit here. Um, I disagree with the officer on that. I'm afraid, um, despite the whole thing, you know, it's really comprehensive. Um, the key policy in which it fails, as I said, is um, Strat Eight. Where it talks about unacceptable visual impact and whether it's um you know it's not whether it's contained it's whether it's acceptable or unacceptable um, members are there um it may be uh, uh um i think your decision um i've lost myself here um because the jet building we talked about the jet building it's first two 20 meters is being de decommissioned um, you can see that that actually is uh, not all of 140 meter. With this 32 meters, you really have to think about the massing of this building. It's it's really very very huge. Um, I think that um, while well, you understand that this is a, um, a case, you know, while it's within the government policy that it's a commercial investment, it's not going to be open source technology. You know, this is this is a commercial development, and so I don't think we should get sort of. Um, misty eyed about that, as it were. Um, I think that um, we need to really concentrate on whether it's acceptable or unacceptable. Um, on the visual impact, I think that um, if you, if it is minded to go and be approved, then we should think about not just the, um, the lighting, which I think is really, really important. I'm glad people brought that up, but also how we can extend the planting. Maybe we can put um, a bit more condition on the planting. When we went there on the site visit, um, there was quite a lot of um, woodland area in part of it, and we could um, really up the ante on how much how much intensification um, of planting there is there, whether it's you know gen uh, deeper and denser planting. Um, and I was talking to Councillor Dragnetti about the front bit, and we said it looks a bit more like a golf course. This is a rural setting. It's not rural. It's not a rural site. It's a rural setting. We could really try and get a condition on intensifying um, the trees and the planting around it, which I think will go a little bit um, to mitigate the impact of it. But um, I still think it's it's such a huge building that I don't think the visual impact is acceptable. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
anyone else do you want to speak? Yeah, I would, I would uh, pick up uh, Councillor Hayes' uh, point, uh, reminding me that I, I don't like the, how the front of this site looks like a golf course, and I was shocked to see the last site visit on the um, 9th of January. The gang was out mowing the front again. You know, how often do they, do they mow it every sort of 10 days throughout the year? You know, destroying any any biodiversity there might be. Um, and I think it just that slightly reflects the approach that uh, on CCS as as to uh, diversity. And I think I would agree with uh, Councillor Hay that we should really be looking for much more denser planting <clears throat> and and not just specimen trees and you know sort of ten foot intervals, but real real thickness of uh, young young small whips that are uh, planted densely grow up much faster than uh, um, and, and will provide much greater shielding. <clears throat> I have to say I'm in two minds about this guy. I still think the government will step in and, and force it through. Um, it will be accused of being nimbies if you refuse it, but um, uh, that's our, that's our, that could be our role. Thank you. Okay. The comments, no further comments. So I'll go back to Councillor Gillespie to sum up or do a sorry, your speech, your seconding speech. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, I think the visual impact clearly outweighed, is outweighed by the global significance of this world changing project. I mean, the officer has said that views from the south of Harm to the park and setting is less than substantial. Um, you know, personally, I'd like to actually congratulate the architect, it's quite a part that is an extremely beautiful building and obviously serving its purpose very well. And um, and in Councillor Gwansky's um, statement about actually the jet set, the jet centre, which I when I climb up the clumps I can see it. So it's quite easy to visualise the difference. The length of that is going to be more bulk than there is from this building here. And then you think of what we have as a big cop party, <laughs> um, which and and the sorrow and the and the tears when 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 they were demolished. But, uh, so basically, the importance of this project clearly outweighs. The um the impact on on the on both the, the park and um safety and handling and so I mean I'll be I, I'm supporting this wholeheartedly because I think it's a really fantastic project and we should be proud as a nation to be doing it. It is a world changing world changing um, energy yes it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to Stephen to uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I wonder if uh, I wonder if councillors can turn to page 47 and you have a proposal that we're debating. And uh, thank you for all councillors' comments and some I respect your views and Peter as well. And in fact, on um, eight and nine of the conditions, landscaping from the heart stand boundary treatment to be submitted, landscape management plan to be submitted. So landscaping is covered, but I would hope that the um, the planning officer would note the comments of the committee that um, the uh, visual aspects of landscape should be beefed up. Um, it, it, it should be a rigorous approach to landscaping of this particular site to improve the biodiversity and also get reduce them, reduce as much as possible the visual impact. I don't think you can to, to, to a large extent. We are looking from a particular angle because the building is going to be, well, I would say here, and there is the jet building behind. So we're only talking from one particular direction, you know, the Newnham Courtney uh, direction. And um, I do actually reiterate again that this particular building is, it is taller by a bit, 38 metres compared with 32, but it is narrower. And it is against the background of the huge jet building, which I assume will stay there. Um, thank the architects for you know, the cladding materials and um, I think I think we have to approve this for you know, for, for the for the greater picture and also the fact that this particular site has been designated in our plan as being a development site there is always debate as to what the visual impact is totally and I respect other councillors views on that particular one but I will um, I would ask councillors to support the recommendation. Thank you. Go back to condition 23. Yes. There's actually yeah. words you could use. I'm going to defer to my colleague here. We, we absolutely um, recognise there's an emergency for, for a sensitive scheme here. I've heard the concerns 
expressed. So we've not only want details of the scheme, but uh, the timings as well. Um, but Kathy, did you want to make a suggestion regarding the review? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's difficult to commit to something here today because obviously there's going to be a lot of investment into it. Um, but I think, yes, if we could build a review, say, after three years, so, and that would be on the, the feature symbolic lighting, obviously not on the, the necessary lighting for the, the functioning of the building and the external areas for safety. So we're looking purely at looking at, at that being a temporary um, sort of permission, if you like, that has to be reviewed and through that review period, sort of any concern about visual impact can be considered when it comes back to the year. Um, that would be our suggestion in terms of the original opportunity that the department has achieved a level of opportunity. Yeah, I think, I think we've made our point and, and the uh, the officers are well aware of what the committee's feelings are on this. Yeah, I'm sure you can find some right words to, to add it into the um, into condition 23. It's quite, quite blunt, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I'm sure that the... Uh... I have something on Yes, OK. It yeah. was the hues as well that I had a concern over, which I should have said, because it, it's not just lighting. It's obviously looking at lighting it in various colours. Throughout the year. Yeah, I think what we've, what we've yeah, I think what we've, uh, done, or all understand is that what we were shown was symbolic lighting by the, by the, by the architects, and and, and uh, that was their wish, and it's not our wish. And could you also stop mowing your front lawn? <laughs> <laughs> in January. In January. <laughs> right, so well, let's. Uh, uh, time to pressing on, and it's nearly we've nearly been here two hours already. We've only got half an hour left, so we'll go straight to the vote. All those in favour of the vote and to approve <laughs> the application, please show. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All those against? One a bit. <laughs> One against. Two abstentions. Oh, no, no, so that is approved. So thank you very much, committee. And I think the debate was quite good. Thank you. I don't want to excuse me for one minute. Yeah. Right. As for everyone with the planning committee, we move on to agenda item nine. Uh, Colleague Colin, first to do Penny Road. Yes, Thank yeah, that, that, that's right. Right, five minute break. I was Many years ago,
agenda item nine. Agenda item nine. Agenda item nine. Agenda item nine. Well, it's 32 Kelly Land Road, Sonning Common. Hopefully, we can get through this in time to be able to just get to the quickly get to the last item. Okay. Um, oh, we have to go before. Who are the answers there? Hello, yes, I am here. You're there. Well done, Mark. Can yeah. I just check? Can you, yes. can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can see that. Brilliant. I'll take you for it. Thank you, Chairman. This application seeks planning permission for the demolition of an existing bungalow on the site and the erection of a pair of semi-detached dwellings in its place. The application site lies within the built-up limits of Sonning Common along the linear plan form of Kennylands Road. The existing property is one of a pair of bungalows which lies um, alongside each other. It is small in size and has no distinct architectural style or special character. The proposed dwelling would be two-storey in height with rooms in the roof. The dwellings would be finished with a red brickwork and slate tiles. The properties measure an overall height of 7.8 metres with an eaves height of 6.7 metres, and the pair would measure a combined width of 13 metres on the plot. To the rear of each property would be a two-storey projection, I'm just going to circle that with my cursor, which would be set in from the boundary of neighbours with single-storey flat roof projections closest to the neighbours. Here we are on this side and this side. Each property would have four bedrooms, three of which would be at first floor level and one bedroom would be contained within the roof space. As outlined within the report before you, it is officer's opinion that the proposed development would incorporate important design details that would respond well to the surrounding area and would be cited and of an appropriate scale as to not appear incongruous within the wider street scene. The development allows for sufficient off-street parking and large rear gardens similar to other properties along Kennylands Road. These slides demonstrate how the property would sit within the immediate street scene, both the front and back of the properties. There are some variety already within the street scene with larger properties and smaller properties. Some properties have gables fronting the road and some have wider, more linear frontages. Some have half tipped roofs and some have full gable roofs. Some properties are detached and there are some semi-detached properties. The majority of properties are finished in red brickwork with some variation seen with the use of slate roofing tiles and the use of render on walls. These are some 3D drawings of how the proposal would look. These slides now show a variety of photographs taken from outside the site showing the immediate street scene. As you can see, the properties to the left are much larger and the property to the right is the same size as the existing site. These slides show photographs from the existing, showing the existing relationship with both adjoining neighbours. This is the relationship with number 34 Kellylands Road, which is the larger two storey property next door. Uh, this is just a snippet of one of the plans I've already shown you, which just shows you the sort of closest aspects to the property. This photo is taken from within the garden of 34 Kennylands Road. This is the application site bungalow. Again here, this just shows a little bit more extent of the garden boundary. The same here is with the relationship with number 30 Kennylands Road, which is the bungalow next door. Again, another little snippet from the plan you've already seen showing the proximity to it and what would be closest to it. Bearing in mind this aspect here is a single story. And once again, another few couple of photos. 
It is officers' opinion that the design of the properties has gone some way by reducing the impact on the neighbours through amendments to an acceptable level. Officers are satisfied that the proposed development would not impact neighbour privacy and would not have an overbearing or intrusive impact upon the amenity of these neighbours. Right, I'm just going to skip really quickly. These neighbours have long and large gardens which remain mostly unobstructed by the proposed development and their closest habitable rooms would remain clear from obstruction. The proposed development would allow for sufficient parking to meet the requirements of the local highway authority. In respect of the ecology, the countryside officer is satisfied that the development should be supported subject to condition. Other material considerations have been considered by your officers within the report before you. It is officers' opinion that the proposed development should therefore be supported and it's recommended that planning permission is granted subject to the conditions outlined within the report before you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. If you can just hang on while we go to our uh, objections, and we'll come back to you for questions. Thank you. OK, um, our speakers have two speakers, Martin Smith and Sam Rust. We're going to share the five minutes between them. OK. All right, I'm Martin Smith. I live at number 34. Um, section 53 of Mark Cullen's report refers to South Oxfordshire Joint Design Guide, which says new development should be proportioned to the size of neighbouring plots. There's a diagram here uh, from the Joint Design Guide. It is quite clear that splitting this garden uh, actually doubles the density. And it is therefore against the joint design guide. Uh, point two, section six five refers to the parish and some neighbours consider the development to be an overdevelopment of the site. This is actually incorrect. All of the neighbours object, apart from one person who lives approximately a quarter of a mile away. Uh, and her uh, appro uh, uh, approval should not be given any weight at all. Uh, section six, six, Mr. Pullen states there are no semi-detached. There, there are semi-detached houses. Actually, on this little stretch that you can see down there and beyond, there are actually no semi-detached houses whatsoever. Okay. Finally, section five two. Uh, Mr. Pullen said policies and neighbourhood plans carry significant weight in decision making. Uh, I would therefore refer you to uh, Sonic Common Neighbourhood Planning uh, thing of page four, pages 44, and uh, Mr. Pullen references H3. If you look again at the page sheets that I've given you, it says particular attention is drawn to the Son in Common character assessment, which specifically mentions Kaylin's Road and says the most important guideline is that any development should respect and ideally reinforce the plot land's character. It doesn't. Uh, I'll therefore uh, say that this proposal meets neither South Oxford Joint Design Guide or uh, the neighbourhood uh, development plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you've got this diagram in front of you as well. I'm a visual person. I can see where things are in books and I find that this helps me. And I think um, Mr. Pullen put in his um, report uh, reminds us of design and character MPP all new developments of a design and size that is in keeping with the surroundings. And visually, I find that picture says most definitely it doesn't comply with that condition. Um, you can see the bedroom sizes of all the properties. Um, six out of the eight are half or less in size compared with the planned development in the circle. And again, I think the picture shows on this picture supplied by the developers that the property is not exactly a uh, similar sort of design to the other properties. They do vary, but this one is very different indeed. Um, and in other parts, he suggests, sorry, that um, I don't think it responds positively to the character and appearance of the built environment. And in section 6.5, he starts by talking about 
local concerns about size and form in context with other properties within the locality, but he ends by uh, saying it doesn't represent an overdevelopment of the site. We're not querying the site, it's got a big garden, but it's much bigger a property than the others nearby. So that I would take issue with. Um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, now, this also emphasises, um, I agree with Mr Pullen, the houses have some gables, they are different, but there is a common factor in the houses in the row, these sort of seven other houses. And I think you can see with this diagram that they tend to have a back line um, beyond which there's no two-storey extensions. This one you can see quite clearly, the brown, orange-brown areas are the extension part. I don't think they're producing nuclear fusion, so I don't think we can justify the fact that they're going to be seen by all of the other properties here. So um, this uh, extension does not physically and visually enhance and complement the surroundings. You have 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, and you really need to reduce that back 40%. Last slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, in the residential and leasing section, it's mentioned that um, the majority of the projection would be single story. Well, the picture that Mr. Pullen showed, it's clearly not. It's less than half. So the it's going to be a very large projection. And if you actually look at the plan, which Mr. Pullen kindly got right for me in the end, um, you can see that 31% is uh, only is flat roofed if the projection is the bit beyond the end of my property. And then you can just see the final point there. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Chair, I could just thank the planning officer for his help here, could I? Okay. Um, I just wanted to say he um, we had issues with our bungalow being shown to 10% too long, and he kindly did an extra site visit to check on that and got the plans to be amended. So thank you very much, Mr. Pullen. That was appreciated. Okay. Good okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioner, have we got any questions for the two directors? Councillor Hillier. Just then to clarify, um, there are, you were saying, other semi detached, but they're not in that section at no. all, are they? No. Yeah. Oh, it reminds me a bit of um, Grace Road, Henley. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Could I ask, on this particular plan, where are you living? Where are you located? I'm in the bungalow next to the He's in number three. So you're there. Yeah, he's in number three. three. And I'm in 34. Right. And could I ask, which of these is, what is a bungalow, 34? No. 30 is the bungalow. 30 is the bungalow. 34 is the two-story. Yeah. Yep. It's a two-story. 32 was a, is a bungalow at the moment, the same size as ours, and it's going to be the larger development that is being debated. You're right. Okay. Okay. Of course, if the government would you bring in uh, any further questions? Not knocking down buildings. Not, okay. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah. sorry. I have to take it. Is some of your things on, on, on the website that you could uh, complete back about the... Uh, being the new development being too close to your overlooking your windows. Is that, is that right? That was a previous comment. I think they changed that. Originally, okay. they had a window on the side that looked straight into a side window that we've got. Uh, uh, so that, I think, has been so changed so in the... One last question, then. You referred, and it's not a planning issue, but you refer to a covenant that's in place. Uh, have you taken legal advice on that? Um, that is not up to us. Um, it, the covenant belongs, basically the two bungalows, one of which is being replaced, yes. were built on grounds belonging to um, the property at the end, the big white house. Okay. And they have the right of the covenant. I think we were told by the planning officer, it's not a planning issue, um, but it would have to be. It's not a planning issue, it's a legal no. issue. I see. And we have had words with the owner of that property. Um, yeah. Thank you for noting all those details. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Right, uh, we'll go back to uh, the planning officer. Uh, Mark, still there, Mark? You're still grinning at us, look. I am, yes, hello. Yeah, yeah, okay. Has anybody got any questions for the officer? Can I, can I just, uh, Mark, could you pull up the, the pictures of the street scene from the front? Yeah. Of the, uh, Proposed in existence. Oh, sorry. Do you mean this or? Uh, well, that. Um, yeah, actually, probably the photograph. Probably the photographs. 
please. Thank you. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of them. I'll, I'll, I'll put that one there because it has all the three properties in, in a row. Right. So the arrow is the site. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, it's sorry, off. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, and there's a two story building on the left, and then there is the bungalow on the right. I just wanted to clarify that particular aspect of it. And can I just ask a technical point, which I should have asked, which I, I should know? Um, how much gap is there either side of these semis, the new semis, to the boundary? What, what is the gap between the wall and the boundary? I believe it is, oh, that's the one thing I didn't measure today, but I measured it the other day. I believe it's um, at least a metre on each side. Yes, I put up a slide if I can no. Right, a metre on each side. And there are no windows. And let's talk about the overlooking aspects then. Um, you have windows in the side of the new property? Only at ground floor. OK, thank you. No worries. Well, I've got the name. Uh, sorry. Just a question Just on the, the neighbourhood plan. That carries full weight, doesn't it? Something common. It does, yeah. 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 Um, yes. Uh, basically, there was a sort of dispute about there not being other semi detached in that area. Yes. So um, you were saying, yeah. Yeah, there, there. Um, I'm admittedly yes. On, on this stretch here, there are no um, semi-detached units, but there are in the wider, which is just outside of this uh, of this area right. photo photograph. But as you as you travel down Kennylands Road, you certainly do experience some semi-detached units. Right. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Mark. Are there any further, any further questions? We haven't got any um, local members here, so I'll go straight to looking for a proposal. I yeah. just a proposed refusal, actually, okay. officer's recommendation, um, because uh, I think it doesn't comply with the Sun in Common Neighbourhood Plan, which does carry weight. Um, I think the uh, people who spoke as objectors are quite correct about 6.3, uh, the MPPF, I don't believe it complies with that. And and I do think it's un unneighbourly. Out of character is a big thing. It reminds me of what we've had in Henley. Like you have a, a long road like that, which you have definite detached properties along, and then you get something detached at another bit. And I think this is a case of trying to alter the character of that road. Okay, is that, is that secondary? We don't have a second one. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we've to someone else for a proposal. I'll second it. Sorry, I have to think Thank about you. that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I have to think about that for a while. Um, I'll speak now, if that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I looking at this, I mean, what's what sort of made me think this is over development of this site is that the the margins on page, but on one of the plans where you're looking from a bird's eye view into the new, the new um, semi-detached boundary. On either side, you said you got a metre, opposite, not that side, isn't it? A metre on either side, so I can't ask you. Whereas if you look at the other houses along those boundaries, they're all they're all substantially within their plot, and some of them are, are upside the plot, but generally they don't take up. Um, anywhere near the amount of space that the, <laughs> these two houses are proposing to take up. There's a lot more space around them. Um, and the height of it as well, plus that, you know, the amount of uh, space it's using the plot makes me feel that this, this, you know, you could easily argue this is overdevelopment. Well, that's not a proposal from your... <laughs> she didn't propose yeah, overdevelopment, yeah, you said character of the area. Yeah. You said character of the area. Yeah, but I think the plan. No, I did say did I mean, because I was really, and I do think it's over intensification of the sound. Yeah. It's not in character as a result. Mm. Okay, All right. Okay, well, we'll go with that then. You're proposing refusal on the grounds of 
is uh, other it, currency with the area. It doesn't comply with MPPR. Would you like me to offer some advice? Yes, I think. Yes. The reasons that have been um, I think the strongest grounds are around the impact upon the established character of this, of this part of Kennedy's yeah. Road and the failure to respond positively to that more spacious character. Yeah. So I'm really want to against over development or the impact upon the neighbours because I believe that um, the applicant can show that they have responded to those points. But there is a, a judgment around the impact upon the character, mm. and um, I think that's. Also, Sam touched on as, as well about the spacing. So, yeah, having spacing. regard to the, the sort of scale design and spacing of the units relative to the established character of that part of the area. And the neighbourhood plan. And we would then yeah. refer to the relevant policy. Yeah, because they've the actually mentioned Kenneran Shrove. Are we content now on the mm. reason for yeah. refusal? Yeah, okay. I'll open debate on that then. See no debate. Or can yeah, no. Use a well-known phrase. It's sort of on balance. Um, the uh, I'm going to I'm going to support this uh, proposal uh, for refusal, and I think the. I mean, I was in two minds. I'll tell you why. Because there is a two-story. I mean, if there's a row of bungalows. And we were whacking a two-story thing, thing on this particular site. Then, of course, the the potential for change of character, the potential for overlooking into the bungalows, because of course a bungalow can't, um, it, it is made. But on one side of this site there is a bungalow, and on the other side there's a two-story building. So we can't actually use that particular that particular argument of two-story. But the argument seem to be proposing is the fact that this is um if this was a detached house then okay but it's the fact that we're massing two seven on this site and as mark said you know the gap from from the brickwork to the boundary is only a meter mm. So therefore it is substantially filling out the rest of the block of course we haven't got details of what what the other plots down the road do, but um, you, you, you draw attention to the to the uh, to the neighbourhood plan, and as the um, people in the spoken against state uh, along Kenilworth Road, the most important guideline is that any development should respect and ideally enforce and reinforce the plot lens of character. Now that's in the neighbourhood plan. Now this is against. Botland's character, so therefore I will support the uh, refusal. Okay, thank you. That's all. Yes, uh, say, a lot of these things are on balance, but uh, I like the, the first thing that we looked at, I would be on the fence for this. I mean, essentially, there is a mix of different properties, although I have to admit they're all, they're all separate, they're a mix of different properties. Uh, I normally go for a meaty space, there's plenty of meaty space. Parking that can be an issue. It has parking. I can't actually see anything wrong with this proposal. They've dealt with overlooking uh, and so on. So uh, I won't be supporting refusal. Okay, thank you. Before we move on, before we any more speakers, we're approaching the uh, witching hour, or half past eight, <laughs> our time limit. So can we just have a vote to carry on with this item? Um, yeah, we'll agree to carry on with this item. Uh, it looks like the last one's going to fall off. Yeah. Chair. I'd just like this to one? add that. Sorry, I just took the plans off for a second just to measure them properly, just, just so that you've all got an actual accurate picture of it. Um, the, the the distance to the south is, is, is just over a metre, but the distance to the one at the top is, is just over two metres. So just, just to make sure everyone's clear of that. Um, so there is a bit more of a generous gap to the, to the north between the site and number 34 up here. OK, thank you. Thank you. That's the first Yeah, again, you know, third time on balance. Um, but uh, I, I, I mean, the reason I, I actually don't think it's particularly out of character, but I do think it's against the neighbourhood plan. 
and therefore that very clearly is indicating that actually this is not appropriate there. So I will be supporting the motion. I will be. Any further comments? No further debate. No further debate. So, Councillor Hilly, I'll go back to you for summing up. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I take on board um, the report, um, the advice from the officer on those points. I do believe the strongest is it goes against the neighbourhood plan, which specifically mentions this road. Um, but uh, I do believe in it being out of um, uh, on the design and character of the MPPF, it goes against that. So as with the guidance of the officer, I stand by those points as the ones for refusal. OK, well, so we have a proposed, uh, yeah, motion proposed and seconded for refusal on the grounds of the uh, scale um, and massing of this development being out of character with the established uh, grade of development in this part of Canadian's Road. Okay. And, and, the and, and the neighbourhood plan. And the neighbourhood plan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll now go for a vote. All those in favour of the motion, please show. One, one, two, three, four, five. All those against? <laughs> Okay, so that proposal is refused then. So I'm not quite up, so we could actually go on to that side and get rid of it. So we'll move on to. Uh, we can leave now. You can just say thank you very yes. much, everybody. Thank we'll you. Move on to um, agenda item 10, which is uh, five like Lydell's close decoys. Um, Sharon, can you quickly take us through it, please? Thank you. And both, thank you for your patience in waiting there at home. So, Jeff, could we uh, extend now? Um, we can extend now to finish this item, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Thank you, sorry, Jeff. Can we take a vote? Sorry, can we take a vote? Yeah, can we extend now? Yeah, thank you. Here we go. Not the two that I'm asking. <laughs> right, Sharon. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to um, make a correction to the report in paragraphs 6.41 and 6.44. The reference to Ryman's Close should read Ryman's Court, and that refers to the three storey retirement flats to the south of the site. This application has been referred to committee because the applicant is a close relation of Councillor Jane Murphy. Planning permission is sought for a five bedroom detached dwelling to the rear of five Lydell's Close in Didcot. Planning permission was granted for a four bedroom bungalow on this site in June 2022. The siting of the proposed dwelling is the same as the approved bungalow. The main difference is to the height of the dwelling to allow for rooms in the roof and windows to the rear elevation. This allows for rooms um, within the roof space, and there's also a slight increase in the size of the integral garage. The dwelling would use the existing access point onto the unmade section of Britwell Road, and parking is provided at the front of the plot on a generous private garden area at the rear. The principle of the dwelling on this site has already been established by the existing planning permission. The neighbour impact and design have been assessed and found to be acceptable. Parking and garden sizes comply with our required standards. There have been no technical objections um, from neighbours or town council or from the specialists. And I recommend that planning permission is granted. Any questions for the officer? I have no speakers registered for this, so we go straight to the back to the officer. No questions for him. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Sharon. Uh, okay. All right. So, I'm going to propose. You're going to propose. Yeah. And, and, and I can say my bit now. I, when this came around last time, uh, we were all in favour mm -hmm. of the development. Um, it's sympathetic to the area. And uh, again, there was comments before on how it would actually improve the local surrounds in its setting and I, I still agree with that conclusion on this particular okay. application. Thank you. Thank you. Close by. Seconded by yeah. Councillor Gillespie. Yeah, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so right. yeah. yeah. I'm happy as well. You're happy as well. <laughs> all right, we'll go straight to the vote. Is everybody happy? Yeah. yeah. You know, vote all of you favour, please show. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's a good Thank you, officer. Thank you. Thank you. Can we end the broadcast? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. The broadcast end. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.